I find it hard to preface the idea of this video. It has taken me months to compile it. Months I've been through hell and stress with exams and school, but I always came back to write. January was so long ago I cannot even remember. In compiling this video I hope to make you feel something. I'm not sure what yet. I guess the best way to consider it is an extension of my beliefs. I'm documented in most regards, but this is a highly opinionated idea of a subject I frankly don't have a lot of control over. I still haven't prefaced it to you and I find it necessary to mention that at the end of the day it's a video with quite a large scope, so if I do make any mistakes, although I've reread the script multiple times, please forgive me. You have been warned, let's begin. I want to mention that initially this video was merely made as a vlog to document my experience within Japan. I went on a trip there in January and I felt that it was important to share my findings with my channel. Although the idea seemed great at first, I quickly came to realize that it would not make for a very interesting video. As such, I decided to describe my own feelings with traveling there and from there came on one of the most interesting case studies I've ever made. I wrote this paragraph mostly to paraphrase the rest of the video and give context behind why it is written the way it is, as well as show you the hook of it, if you might call it that. I've recently been on a trip to Japan, well, recently doesn't properly do it justice. It was a while back, but I really needed time to reflect on the days I spent there, mostly because of the culture shock I experienced, not only upon landing, but walking around the country itself. It felt sort of surreal that I was so far away from home all the way on the other side of the earth, in the eastmost parts of Asia, where I had never personally set foot in beforehand. Now, the thing is, I've flown far distances before in the past, mostly on my trip to the US back in 2019, where I had experienced a similar feeling to this time's flight, and I don't know how to describe it. I guess you could classify it as the same culture shock and difference from my own country as I felt with America, but the experience here was totally different, rather oxymoronically so. So almost like these two places were opposite on some sort of tangible spectrum. In the sense of scale and place, they sort of are, however, at least on the globe, I'm not sure I fully understood what I wanted to experience. But still, that was not it, and I just felt so entranced by this feeling I couldn't explain that I just had to sit down and try to rationalize it to someone. For myself, perchance? Even if I couldn't put it into words that well. So I got home and started looking through the photos I had taken on this trip. And this feeling started slowly seeping into myself. And that got to the point where I had decided that I want to take this opportunity to reflect on the abstract emotions I got while visiting, but also sort of present my time there in the purest form possible. So I decided I was going to make a video out of it, an authentic recollection. But even so, it didn't feel right. I just wanted to say that from the beginning, since this will not be your typical vlog. And I think I'm about to derail a lot from the subject of actually traveling, since I decided to do so the moment I sat down at the table. So if you're looking for a travel guide or a recommendation, you have come to the wrong place. And I strongly suggest you seek out a different video. This one will mostly focus on the intrinsic appearance of the global landscape there, but also the globalized part of it, that regards the more technologically advanced wonders of this country. Maybe even feelings described as aesthetics, I'm not sure yet, but one thing is clear. You, the viewer, need to prepare for this, because it will probably be a crazy ride full of twists and turns that I, that even, you know, I don't know where it will take us. As I'm writing this video, I'm merely in the beginning, but I just have a feeling it will set in very slow. Alright, let's start first by running it back to perhaps my first experience traveling outside of Europe. Since, I think that will be crucial when talking about the Japan trip, and it will also provide critical information to myself about what set me off in wanting to write this video. Years have passed since my first venture outside the continent of Europe, all the way to the tumultuous waters of the US of A. But the dry and scorching sun of Florida, mostly Miami and Orlando, is still ingrained in my mind from all the way back then. 
The sensation of nearly liquefying under its relentless heat persists even to this day. Thing is, I was only visiting in winter, so I could not imagine how unbearable the summer there would have been. The heat was astonishingly insane, lending an eerie, almost dystopian aura to the landscape. Devoid as it was of pedestrian friendly spaces, appearing desolately empty. I think this sort of feeling isn't really portrayed in a lot of media. The feeling that the AC is your only hope of shielding yourself against the powerful rays of the star above you. A lot of westerns and movies with cowboys showcase the sort of American landscape that has the deserty characteristics I was just talking about, but they don't show it in modern day, neither can they provide my exact experience. So it's not necessarily about the deserted landscape and more about the things that are in between it, sort of like a balance of nature and humanity. So that's why none truly captured the full extent to which the urban environment with its buildings, vehicles and infrastructure creates a bubble wherein life seems compelled to adapt the surroundings to human needs, raising buildings and roads and roads and buildings and stretching highways along thousands of miles into the next Walmart, the next mall, as such gating itself from nature and heat. I think my biggest Shock was visiting an almost abandoned mall between Miami and Orlando somewhere. I really don't know where I was, my family had merely stopped there out of curiosity. Reflecting on this now it feels even more surreal, the emptiness, the scarcity of people on the street at that hour on a weekend, all contributed to an unsettling atmosphere and sometimes this sort of atmosphere translated even outside through the lack of people on the streets. Other times it translated to an uneasy feeling as the weird electrical buzzing the ACs were making outside this enormous building, the way the parking spots were all empty despite the immense scale it had. But even inside some stores were still open, yet some remained entirely empty, vacant, dark and liminal but to a dystopic degree, because they weren't really abandoned, they were just in decline, falling never to be caught in a safety net again. Particularly surreal as well was the journey to the Keys all the way to Hemingway's house in Key West. As you just go down this long road that feels like it has no end, yet there's sometimes houses along it. I distinctly remember seeing a pizza hut in the middle of nowhere on that road. I think it was abandoned as well, or closed, it just felt strange that it was there in the first place, because who would eat there? Perhaps I couldn't rationalize my internal thoughts back then, but doing so now, I've had time and time again feelings of the same caliber hitting the back of my head, itching me to question if someone else had felt this weird about the insanity I had seen, which to some seemed like pure normality, nothing out of the ordinary because you just get used to it. I asked myself and once again blamed the capitalist hellhole that represents the American dream for creating its own torture device that I could not put into mere words. That doesn't mean I despise its system, my country may know best the horrors of communism and this isn't necessarily about the capitalism, it's perhaps just the terrible way in which not only infrastructure but technologies and trends evolved there. And there I was back at square one, unsure of how to describe it. Curse had I again my own mind for not knowing someone else to portray my thoughts for me. Although I think someone out there did portray my feelings about it perfectly. That feeling of infinite concrete roads spanning between giant Walmarts, dust flying in the atmosphere as you just wander around this sort of desert endlessly. However, as I remember that I simultaneously decided I'm going to hold off a bit on that information. We'll discuss that person later, after I've painted a clearer picture of what I meant through this feeling. The aforementioned feeling could only dream of coming in second to none other than the one which was rocking me and my world to our cores when I landed in Japan. This video isn't really about the country of Japan itself, as I've said previously, but I think I do really want to talk about how ingrained it is in technology and this sort of schizophrenic depiction of hyperreality, because I could not call it anything else, and I thought I needed to talk about my experience with America, because this end of the stick went in the pure opposite direction in some regards, perhaps. 
I don't wish to do a regular vlog where I just present on a day-by-day -day basis what happened when I was in Japan. Rather, I'd like to analyze and sort of dissect what I really felt. I hate being the bearer of bad news, but Japan isn't special in that regard. After a few days, the culture shock had started to diminish and I finally felt what it really was that was outwardly portraying this feeling. And that is the sheer scale, weirdness and interconnectedness of the urban landscape around the Tokaido megalopolis. The cities I had traveled within and between felt like getting whipped around by a portal from a parallel world to our own. No, maybe not to that extent, but it clearly was an entirely different culture and country. I think something similar could be said about South Korea as well. Even then, I needed a way to convey this feeling and began slowly associating it with pieces of media I had consumed from this country. It all felt like a surreal hyper-reality, because of course a country's culture is reflected in the media produced within it, but of course that media is also influenced by other countries, so it sort of gains a hyper-real identity. Hyper-reality is a tricky thing to explain, but the basic idea is, in a hyper-real condition, in this case, the distinction between reality and representation becomes increasingly blurred to the point where it is difficult or even impossible to discern the difference. This blurring is often driven by the proliferation of media and technology, which creates an abundance of simulated experiences that can be mistaken for reality. One example that I often hear cited is to illustrate hyperreality is the modern theme park. In a theme park, the environment is carefully constructed to copy real-world settings or environments from media, be it books, films, or anything for that matter. But it does so in a hyperbolic and exaggerated manner. People often feel as though they are experiencing something real, but in fact they're engaging with a carefully curated simulation. Thing is, I personally didn't feel like I was walking through a simulation felt more out of body and strange, experiencing the myriads of advertising and strange customs, which I'm personally not used to. By that I mean lack thereof in some regards, like wearing shoes inside or only washing your hands before you eat in some cases. Of course, I don't condone the lack of hygiene or even insinuate the mod most people do it, but having friends from the US and having asked around, they've all told me that yeah, they do see it happen quite often there. While I think that my feelings could be choked up to the fact that it was something new and unusual for myself, I still think it's quite weird. I've traveled all over Europe and I've never had such a powerful culture shock beforehand. Actually, wait a minute, because I think here we can draw the parallels back to the person I spoke about earlier when describing my experience in Florida. Even back then I felt weirdly disconnected from this ultra-consumerist amalgamation that was America. At least to me, a foreigner, it seemed like something was odd, in the regard that it felt artificial to a certain extent. Even taking out my bias as a tourist and watching into this foreign country, so I sort of get this specific idea that I'm seeing the country from the perspective of a tourist, someone sent there to see exactly what the people of the country want me to see. But still, there's no way the environment and at least some of the authentic atmosphere does not end up rubbing on me. And when I am a tourist, that usually seems to be the case. So I find it important to talk about a man so ingrained into this sort of cultural zeitgeist of hyper-reality and consumerism that's sort of happening all over America, Asia and slowly spreading to Eastern Europe as well. I'm talking about someone who ended up portraying my feelings through music, not only about the experience I had gone through in Florida, but even Japan to a certain extent. I'm talking of course about none other than James Ferraro. James Ferraro may as well be the only individual ever to invent as many strange music genres as he did. It's quite crazy how many there are. At the same time, he is very influential and seems a bit crazy, the good kind of craziness. He's an American-born musician that has been a preeminent figure in underground music scenes, particularly in the realms of electronic, ambient and vaporwave genres, even leading to the invention of some very strange experimental genres. Although his presence even in music spans across a lot of different music projects and has, he has previously dipped his toes in films and even Roblox videos, what the hell is this? 
Anyways, his work often explores themes of consumer culture, technology, and the internet age, creating soundscapes that are both dissonant and captivating, and sort of bring a sleep-induced vibe to them. I'd mostly like to focus on two specific albums today, but I prefer taking them in order, so you'll have to be patient with me before I name drop them both. As I said, one album that specifically portrayed my experience of America perfectly would be the one titled Last American Hero. While having quite a cliché name and being quite on the nose about its inspiration, it hides more than the naked eye seems at first. Not only does it portray this post-apocalyptic, costco-induced landscape of automation through its drone-esque drums and western-feeling guitars that keep getting louder as the track progress, but it ends up creating a story of technology taking hold of the, the wasteland. Ferraro's personal account about the inspiration of this album was talked about in the Fireside interview he took a few years back. There he talks about how the ideas for this album came to him when he was visiting his grandparents in a gated community in Florida, and the feelings he got were also strangely out of body, so he felt the need to place it into music a clip of him talking about it from the interview so you can see exactly what I mean. Last American Hero was actually recorded on the same uh, period but I, it was after a, a trip um, in Europe. I went back and stayed with my grandparents actually in, in Florida again and like they um, live in this like really you know insane gated community of like senior citizens and like large like flat screen TVs and like just insane ikea couches like you know what I mean? that you can't even really sit on you know what i mean they're just like too big and like pt cruisers and in this infrastructure of gated communities and walmarts and targets and these just like complexes of like you know of shopping and that was their entire world you know the part where it gets aft most interesting is the back of the vinyl box of the album which has a bunch of stories all tied to each track from it they're dystopian and sort of scary in a way, they portray modern times and are still pertraining to reality. One about a gladiator enhanced by some all-powerful energies driving his metal slave around the desert that leads to the end of a highway. Of course, this story is merely a metaphor to a man drinking monster while driving his motorcycle. But the way it's phrased just screams outwards towards the reader. Hey, I'm based on something real! I'm just going to read this one out loud to show what I mean. On a lost highway, underneath the desert skies, where the roar of her voice is heard, the energy-enhanced gladiator wishes to merge as one with his girl. Isn't it strange, the way it's written? Yeah, I thought so too, but it is extremely interesting at the same time, and the way it presents machinery in such a regard. It feels very Mad Max, if I might say so. The second story features a can of monster rolling around the desert endlessly, presumably having been consumed by the man in the first story. But the third one is intriguing. It's framed as a news article about a group of humans presumed lost for over a decade and a half that were found alive camping within the back recesses of a Costco supermarket. So essentially the backrooms of such a store. This strikes me as incredibly odd because the concept of backrooms as a place of somewhat horror in an out of bounds aspect hadn't been popularized until much later, way after the release of this album, which mind you was released in 2009. Thing is, having listened to this album I got what Ferraro meant, but I also felt like my time in America resonated with this story. The long roads, the heat, the radio inside the car, carbonated drinks, just felt utterly hopeless in a way I hadn't felt before. The abandoned mall as well. It was sort of idyllic, but for how long could you keep the illusion of safety going? I think the American dream quite literally encourages driving, but the more gated the community is, hidden perhaps, technologically entangled, the scarier this feeling gets like a citadel of power in the middle of a desert of opportunities, each road spanning and breaking apart into the next city that represents another monster. I don't think the road itself is bad, but the feeling you get from traveling, from these behemoths of metal, is what's scary about it. Cultures around the world focus heavily on the concept of travel, and I'd rather say that the drives themselves are just distractions from the globalized front. 
While I'm aware now that these elements just represent a form of escapism from the cities, I still think that the road could be as terrifying in its own right. And that's exactly the point that struck me the most as outwardly strange. It's not the road, it's the fact it's a 12-lane monster of a highway built with the blood, sweat and tears of those enslaved by the system. With so many exits that it gets dizzying. The fact that still felt like Ferraro's song portrayed shards of memories of my time there, be it the abandoned malls, the overwhelming heat, the long roads, the empty streets, the overcarbonated sodas full of sugars, I think part of me remained there, trapped. Part of me stayed in that theme park or abandoned mall and is no longer with us. Just a little part. A part that reminds me that there's no way of getting anywhere without hitting the road. None shall walk, all shall drive. Ferraro made an album about countries like Japan and South Korea as well, titled in quite a fitting way, I Asia. The album does an extremely good job of portraying the interconnectedness feeling of those countries and the ideas that technology is evolving faster than most humans can keep up with. While the heat is no longer an issue, everything is crowded and technologically complex soundscapes spanning AM radio sound waves and faraway small phones and gadgets which emit signals are now ever present. The sounds are much more electronic and less tangible than before. Gone are the long sad riffs of Last American Hero and in are the scenes that feel so far away and disconnected they're out of a different world. It's all very radio wavy. And I think that's the most important part. So allow me to tie it all together. I'd say the way my Japan trip could be seen is more like an intersection between hyperreality, which I just spent a hefty chunk of the video talking about, and Denpa, not only as a genre but as a concept. You might obviously not know what Denpa is, but that's exactly what I'm here for. I much preferred separating the beginning of this video in such a way before delving deeper into what I'd consider the most important part of experiencing a fraction of what my mind went through. Detailing Ferraro's work was important because he understands how these massive spans of civilization feel. Through iAsia and everything he portrayed, Dempa, especially through music in a way as well. Not through the music genre Dempa, but more through the feeling Dempa. However, even before defining the concept of it, I need to talk about my flight back to Romania, the country where I live. Upon arrival back from America, I was walking through the park one evening, admiring the stars, and I realized how lively my city felt through all of that. Even though the emptiness of the park at the late hour in winter, nature felt like it was, I don't know, present, and that hyperreal feeling had faded. So. I didn't linger on it, neither did I feel the need to express it. It got left to the back of my mind. Years passed and time flew. And at one point this year, I discovered James Ferraro's work. And it reminded me of my time then, and all of the things I had done, and the way my life felt now. I ended up listening to both I Asia and Last American Hero, but only got Last American Hero for a while. That is, until I landed in Japan. Even then, I haven't yet defined Dempa or spoken about games and media that fall into the genre, so I don't blame you, dear viewer, for being rather confused. I think a lot of the concepts of Dempa stem from the physicality of technology and its ever presence in life. It all started with overhead power lines, radio towers, and the ominous feelings this gave. Then it went on to be giant screens, and afterwards, slowly transitioned to an ever present feeling of being. Trapped. I'm reluctant to define the term because I want to have control over the way I portray it as to not portray it in a bad light. It is not simply a visual aesthetic and because of that reason alone I'm going to take you through a trip before reaching the definition. I think this could easily fall into the same ideas presented even by ancient Greek myths, sort of inviting you to theorize about this. I think the myth of Narcissus does this the best, mostly to the way of the ego. Narcissus was a hunter from Thespia in Boe Boeotia, in Greek mythology. 
He was incredibly beautiful, so much so that regardless of gender, people noticed his beauty. According to the best known story of him written by Ovid, Narcissus turned down all suitors and lovers which came his way, ultimately becoming captivated by his own reflection in a pool of water, unaware of what it truly was. Enamored by his image, he faced great sorrow and, in some telling, he struck his chest until it turned purple from the pain of being separated from his reflection, some versions even ending up taking his own life. But from the spot where he had perished, a flower emerged, which was named after him. The tale of Narcissus gives rise to the term narcissism, describing a self-absorbed personality trait. When this trait is present to an extreme degree, it defines narcissistic personality disorder, a mental health condition characterized by an inflated sense of self-importance and an insatiable craving for admiration and a lack of empathy for others. Does this sound familiar? Well, it does, it's probably exactly because it was indeed a cautionary tale for what was to come. Social media. The same concepts are applied as it exacerbates these narcissistic tendencies by encouraging a constant pursuit of likes, comments, and followers. This digital validation fosters an unhealthy preoccupation with self-image and approval, and eventually leads to a distorted sense of self-worth and diminished ability to emphasize with others. I'm going to mention this but one name a specific study. There's research on the effect of social media withdrawal and how it impacts our dopamine levels. Whenever we hear the chime of a like notifications, our brain releases dopamine, the feel-good neurotransmitter, which creates a cycle of dependency. This craving for digital affirmation makes withdrawal symptoms similar to those experienced with substance addiction, leading to anxiety, irritability, and a profound sense of loss the moment we don't have our phones on us. Unfortunately, due to the way modern-day social ladder is built, you will need it at one point or another in the future. Similarly, ads entrap us because ultimately we get stuck in the mirror. What's the whole point of an ad? It's to advertise the product to the buyer. So how's the best way of doing that? Well, it's appealing to the buyer, the specific you that's behind the screen right now. Nowadays, most products don't even make a case for their product. They just make a case for why you should have the product. And when it's all about you, it's always going to be about. I've had conversations with friends specifically from the US about this, about the concept of advertising, and we've spoken about how individualism in culture perpetuated the idea ads should be targeted towards the self as well. When you have philosophers like Kant and Freud who talk about the self for far too long, that's what happens. The world adapts, it evolves around the self. We think that our problems stem from money, kind of always have, but I think nowadays we're too focused on what's good for us and not so much on what's so good for the rest. When everything is about you, you are bound to crack. And the thing is, this isn't even that new. This entire movement and idea of advertising to each person started way back when the radio was first introduced to a large population. In the 1920s, radio became widespread and in with it came a large number of reforms surrounding the idea of information and its ability to travel. While it didn't reach that degree as fast as that, the first seed was planted and it began a sort of mass hysteria. They used to call it the madness of the radio, especially in Mexico. The University of Toronto has a very well written article about this. Well, one Ruben Gallo wrote it, but it goes quite in extensive detail about this idea. So, I'm going to use his article as an example, talking about it. He mostly talks in this article about how, in the early 1920s, the Mexico City Weekly had become the home of avant-gardists who expressed great interest in the idea of radio. The integration of radio technology into the cultural fabric of 1920s Mexico was not merely technological advancement. It was a cultural revolution, which led groups like the Estridentistas, a large and quite known avant-gardist faction formed of artists and poets to exemplify this transformation with their imaginative and often surreal explorations of radio's potential. This is often seen throughout historical study and documentation, the drastic shift of generational thought and spirit with the introduction of new technologies. The most severe cases being the introduction of the printing press, the introduction of the clock in the Industrial Revolution, and the introduction of the internet 
and even the smartphone. When the radio was introduced to the world, groups like those mentioned above and other known avant-gardist factions formed out of artists and poets exemplified this transformation with their imaginative and often surreal explorations of the radio's potential. It's very interesting that avant-gardists found the radio to be a positive cultural phenomenon because this has very cool ramifications later down the line in the video, mostly through its presence in Dempa culture. Anyways, the popularity of the radio in the 1920s can be compared to modern day obsession with social media. Both technologies have revolutionized communication, transforming societal norms and personal interactions. Just as avant-garde poets and artists of the 1920s embraced radio for its potential to revolutionize language and cultures, today's influencers and content creators utilize social media to shape contemporary culture and trends. Although not to such noble cause at all times. Mostly there's a great wild goose chase for money nowadays, because social media is, and will always be, Narcissus's water puddle. In Mexico City, radio's influence extended beyond entertainment, impacting literature, art, politics, architecture, and advertising. The first radio station in Mexico City was launched by literary magazine El Universal Ilustrado and featured avant-garde poet Manuel Mapulhacar reading uh, his poem, El Poema de la, de la Radiofonia. This poem celebrated modern technology and internationalist aesthetics, themes that resonate with today's global digital culture, facilitated by social media and with the whole idea of globalism. Maple Ar Arca's work, filled with neologism and references to radio pioneers like Hertz, Mar Marconi and Edison, captured the excitement and bewilderment of that time. Noticing pattern as early as the invention of wireless communication poses quite an interesting question of the ability of it to control the masses, and that it was used for countless time among history, just like written word and any other types of writing. The madness of the radio per permeated all aspects of life in 1920s Mexico, exemplified by, by the Radio League's promotion and the radio fair at the Palacio de Miniera. Companies like El Universal Ilustrado and El Buen Tono leveraged radios allure to market products, introducing radio sodas and radio cigarettes, thus forming ordinary items into symbols of modernity. El Buen Tono, a cigar company, went as far as to build a radio station to broadcast to their customers. They even offered radio parts in exchange for empty cigarette packets, thus modernizing their clientele by making radio technology more accessible. Antenna, edited by Francesco Mo Monter de Gracia y Casbalseta, emerged uh, as a literary platform deeply influenced by radio. It included works from contemporaneous groups featuring poetry and essays that explored radio's role in modern life. The magazine's radio section provided practical advice on operating receivers while also celebrating radio as a cultural phenomenon. Novo's radio lecture and its subsequent publication in Antenna reflect the dynamic interplay between radio and literary innovation. Ultimately, the introduction of radio led to it being a widespread phenomenon, rather than a serious concern for causing madness, as I said above. It was more like a craze, although radio waves have been shown to induce physical madness in a few studies. Particularly, I can cite a study conducted by HAL Science, which claims some frequencies can cause damage to the brain tissue and disrupt its normal function. A lot of other studies show that technological advancement and the ever-present idea of having invisible waves of electromagnetic qualities in the air may be the cause for a lot of stress and modern-day anxiety disorders. Although I doubt any of the claims I've stated above have been seriously proven due to the fact there'd be insane outrage over that and constant protests. As it stands, most types of radio frequency radiation have not been found to cause harmful health effects, including cancer. Radio frequency radiation is a type of non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation, so it technically shouldn't have any type of effect on your health. However, the psychological effects of believing in such harm can be profound because it can induce a placebo. This brings us to the concept of electromagnetic hypersensitivity or EHS, which has been featured in fictional narratives before in order to explore the intersection of technology, psychology and perception to be more exact. 
I'd say one of the most preeminent examples is the character of Chuck in the Breaking Bad spin-off Better Call Saul. Fair warning, there will be light spoilers ahead. Nothing of insane plot relevance or something that is not revealed in the first season of the show, but I will still add a time step so you can skip ahead if you wish. In Better Call Saul, there's this character named Chuck who is Jimmy's brother. Chuck was the sanctimonious older brother. His way and will went because it upheld the highest human good, the law. Since he was little and had enough ambition to drag himself out of financially dire situation he was born into, he became a highly accomplished lawyer in Albuquerque, New Mexico. From a young age, Chuck exhibited a keen intellect and a strong sense of duty, traits that would later define his career. Around 2001, in the show's continuity, Chuck began to experience what he believed to be a symptom of electromagnetic hypersensitivity, or EHS, a condition where he claimed to suffer adverse physical reactions to electrical devices. This condition forced Chuck to step away from HHM and live in seclusion, surrounded by lanterns and devoid of any modern electronic conveniences. While his doctors and his own family were skeptical of the legitimacy of his condition, Chuck was sure the condition must have been real, leading to him losing not only people close to him, but making a series of mistakes which would lead to a lot more being sacrificed in the process. Chuck McGill's case highlights a crucial aspect of the debate surrounding electromagnetic waves, the psychological impact of belief. While scientific evidence does not support the idea that electromagnetic radiation causes physical harm, the psychological effects of believing otherwise can be significant. Chuck's intense belief in his EHS drove him to his strange behavior and emotional vulnerabilities. I'm not sure if Chuck's character was based on other instances of placebo effects meddling with people's perception of the electromagnetic environment or even the rise of new technologies around them, but it's clear that ultimately believing in such a thing requires a certain amount of craziness something that has been done in the past, however, clearly and outwardly. To be more exact, in 1981 in the Fukugawa region of Japan. It might have been a case of mass hysteria, yet I doubt there's any reported sightings of other people receiving voices from electronic devices or by such means at the time. But there is quite a lot of them afterwards, so I'd consider this is the patient zero of a type of mass hysteria which he started here in Japan in 1981. The year, on the 17th of June, in a shopping center located in the Koto ward of Tokyo, where a former sushi restaurant employee who was abusing methamphetamine couldn't find a job and blamed it on his former employers at the sushi restaurant. In a fit of rage, began attacking passerbys indiscriminately in the shopping center. He ended up killing four people, which included small children and housewives, and injuring another two. Eventually, he got caught. When the trial took place, he admitted to the crimes, but stated, For many years I was harassed by the radio waves and tapes sent by the perpetrator. The store owners who fired me or refused to employ me were also accomplices. I thought about killing someone and ending my life decisively. Defendant K was in a state of severe hallucination at the time of the crime and was incapable of distinguishing right from wrong either due to a loss of mental capacity or at least diminished mental capacity. The defense requested another mental evaluation. And this is where the term DEMPA originally stemmed from. Wikipedia cites DEMPA as being a Japanese term for people who may feel disconnected from reality or dissociated from the people around them. Individuals with schizophrenia may experience vivid fantasies, persecutory delusions or other intense beliefs. Their speech and actions may appear odd or confusing to those around them. This societal perspective is similar to the way Japanese culture views otaku, who suffer from maladaptive daydreaming disorder, paranoia or schizophrenia. Dempa literally means electromagnetic wave, and the original sense of Dempa K and Dempa San was of someone who thought they were receiving voices, thoughts, or instructions directly to their mind via electromagnetic radiation. The term was originally tied to the Fukagawa series of killings in 1981, in which the man mentioned above killed four people due to paranoia and resentment of his employers. The man later claimed to be influenced by radio waves, saying that they caused him to commit the murders. 
The Empire then became a diverse Japanese fiction genre that centers around topics of delusion, asociality, and a sense of losing connection with reality, often being associated with the idea of electricity, power lines, radio towers, the internet, and parts of cities being alive in perception. It is interesting to think about if this madness was not determined by their lifestyle, as in a lot of cases of such individuals from the white UK era, I've gathered that most parents blamed their hermit-like lifestyles on their mental anguish, stating that their reductive behavior and refusal to interact with society is what drove them there. An interesting question to pose is what drives someone mad, and more importantly, what caused them to be raptured from reality. During the time where more and more cases of Denpaki and Denpa-san were popping up around Japan, Denpa fiction was pioneered through the visual novel and the eroge video game genres. For example, the Denpa game Shizuku, released in 1996, is often cited as the first visual novel. It's strange going back to PC-98 era games like those, especially because Shizuku is very flawed in many regards. It fails often at being a compelling or eroge game, the writing is quite clunky and strange and fails short of building the characters in a meaningful manner. So even so, despite the fact it's one of the pioneering titles in the visual novel genre in Japan, it doesn't really stand up well compared to modern visual novels. It is often considered a classic due to its influential role in shaping the narrative and thematic elements of future visual novels. But I think the visual aspects are more important in this case, in portraying its Tempa-like appearance. This can be mostly chalked up to the very nice looking pixel art. The way it combines real-life photography, downsized and monochrome with cutesy looking amateurishly drawn characters really creates a strong juxtaposition. The way the text scrolls and the way its soundtrack sounds all give that distinctly stuck in the 90s aesthetic that is often presented in a lot of Denpa media. See, it reminds me a lot of a specific episode in Boogie Pop Phantom where one otaku plays some uh, visual novel similar to this one. It's the one episode very similar in feeling the perfect blue, boasting a wide array of quite creepy factors, not only from the use of drugs, but from the psychotic outright stalker character. The main character of the episode is an average high schooler student, despite being a bit of a loner. However, he is under constant pressure from his father to receive good grades, so he could get into a good university. Constantly being reminded of such, the pressure he internalizes is an artificially inflated from what his father actually expects, resulting in him feeling cornered with no way out. His father states a few times how his son doesn't need to go to a top school, but at least a state university most likely just wants the best for him. Suganuma, the main character, instead feels overwhelmed with the expectation to be successful and doubts his ability to succeed, so he starts to seek refuge in the world of bishojo games, not uncommon to many other reclusive youths in Japan. These circumstances are some of the reasons why young Japanese men turned to the lifestyle of a hikikomori in the first place. The overwhelming societal and familial pressure were nothing but the greatest successes applauded. They crack under the weight of expectations, as is the case with Suganuma, who starts to spend most of his time either at work or playing the bishojo game at home. He starts to become obsessed with the heroine of one of his games due to his desire to completely forget about his life's problems. Then stuff starts to get weird, reality starts to become increasingly difficult to distinguish from his drug-induced delusions as he starts to project the image of the game's heroine on his new younger co-worker. This is one of the few episodes I think captures the feeling of Denpa. I will ho however develop that in relation to Boogie Pop Phantom when I get further down the line. For now, returning to Shinzuku. Its similarities are not necessarily in the style of the visual novel from Boogie Pop, but it presents itself through faint impressions of presentation. It lends me the opportunity to think a lot about the turn of the millennium. It's very interesting to think back to the CRT era, because the internet and video games closer and closer to the year of 2000s lend themselves in a very interesting manner to the idea of Denpa. However, I think Shinzuku's aesthetics work in its favor because the pixel art lends it a very powerful fabricated look which creates a sort of uncanny valley feeling. Especially some of the characters juxtaposed with the strange looking students from the background. It really feels like a relic of a time long gone. 
the lost decade, as some people call the transitional period between the mid-90s and the early 2000s. Turning to the topic of Dempa, I think it can be considered pretty diverse because it can apply to a subculture of people, a character trope, a musical genre, and a fiction genre, primarily present in video games and anime shows. In other words, the genre often depicts those persons in mundane environments experiencing the breaking of reality. It really makes you wonder how some of these extreme cases and even the people depicted within the genre seek their own fantastical delusions and become so entranced with them perhaps out of boredom of the mundane life they do live. It's perhaps societal pressure cracking down on the idea of being alive, the plague that is consumerism and a bit of depression which leads people to these often dark paths. Still, the question remains, how do you get bored of living? This isn't really an idea of not being content with your life. Such factors come into play, but it's more so about what has happened to a being capable enough of becoming so much more to delude and escape away from all these ideas and feelings they garner. I think, ultimately, this falls down to an unwavering wish to escape the mundane and leave behind the ever-present feeling of escapism. Escapism is a psychological concept where individuals seek distraction and relief from unpleasant realities, often through entertainment, fantasy or other activities that provide a mental diversion. It is a way to temporarily avoid the stress, boredom or hardships of everyday life. Often, Dempa is presented as the wish of escapism facing into reality. Such examples of Dempa where escapism becomes the central focus can be found in diverse formats and popular media including video games, more so in the visual novels and erotic genres, light novels, manga, and anime and music. Dempa video games usually form part of the larger visual novel genre. In fact, the first visual novel games were ever marketed as Dempa. Dempa game genre typically features a distinctive style that incorporates elements of technology like electromagnetic or radio waves such as antennas and telephone poles and also explore topics that are often considered taboo in Japanese society such as paranoia, anxiety, delusion, madness, trauma, depression and even suicide, typically in urban areas. However, Dempa music is rather characterized by its distinctive moe aesthetic. The aesthetic that Dempa music uses is often called Moe Dempa to visually set it apart from the gloomier traditional style. Although classic Dempa is found in a lot of the most popular works ever made, including stuff like Neon Genesis Evangelion, its definition is quite vast in the sense that it's highly adaptable and quite flexible as an element of fiction, but it's also something which is very much ever present in the real world, and not necessarily specific to Japan. It's important to remember what I said earlier when talking about the estridentistas, because works that fall into this category are almost always catalogued as being avant-garde. In that regard, they deal with very complex emotions through abstract effects and usually are extremely hard to properly grasp, but they do end up lending themselves useful to portraying specific emotions, mostly through early internet culture and its effects on global perception. Remember when there was a time that people had even a slightest idea the internet might be filled with ghosts? Yeah, a lot of early creepypasta started from the idea that technology might be possessed by living spirits inhabiting our devices. Although these fears make sense in retrospect, they've been present since the early days of technology and even fiction writing through works like Asimov's iRobot. The idea that the creator resents its creations is often presented in fiction and the idea that we would be scared of technology is something we've created is as such very logical. It really makes you wonder if the concept of divinity truly is real, would that divinity not despise us for what we have become? In modern culture and fiction, the idea is separated from the conception of creation and is often presented especially to the younger generation. In this case, classic creepypastas like Ben Drowned or a plethora of other internet mysteries and theories like the infamous 666 YouTube channel. I think things like that would certainly fall into the category of Tempa. I think certainly movies are an interesting subject. 
perfect example of the thing I'm talking about is the 2001 Japanese horror slash thriller movie Pulse, which tackles the idea of ghosts being trapped inside electronic devices. Mainly through the idea that once ghosts occupy all of the possible physical space they could on earth, there would be no more space for these entities to go to, and as such they start haunting online spaces, be it the internet, screens in general and even phones. The film portrays modern society's growing isolation and alienation despite increased connectivity through technology. Characters in the movie are often seen alone and their attempts to connect with others only lead to further isolation, symbolizing the paradox of how technology intended to connect people can also drive them apart. The argument can be made that digital isn't really being truly together and was never designed to bring people closer that way. But in the digital age, we're so far apart, yet so close together, but not in a physical sense. And as such, we can never be connected. This is because, be it metal and digital, are no replace for flesh. In the flesh, you see another countenance, filled with flaws and all. The metal reflects your own always, the screen does so too. In the digital age, you are alone, though connected, and I think this movie understood that. It certainly comes out of a period from the early 2000s where digital spaces were in their infancy and the general consensus was that even demons could exist among them. Although the idea of it and the way it's portrayed in this movie isn't only terrifying but it's also nostalgic. It may have some of the best utilizations of CG and some of the most interesting concepts, yet it loses itself with time. Time and time again it portrays decadence and towards the end there's no separation between the analog space and the real one as it starts gaining a hyper-real condition and you start questioning what exactly does it all mean. The movie delves into existential fears, particularly the fear of death and what lies beyond. The ghosts in Pulse are depicted as lonely and desperate, highlighting the terror of an afterlife where one is condemned to eternal isolation. This is used within the movie to create a metaphor for the fear of being forgotten or the dread of a meaningless life and existence. In a way, Pulse has the inverse effect on Evangelion's end scene. I think this mixture of Dempa sensibilities among the hyper-real uncanny feeling of being abandoned and lonely that reached the climax in the final 30 minutes left upon me a feeling so powerful it transcended the weakest part of the movie. The film's bleak tone and the gradual disappearance of people into shadows suggests a world where humanity is fading away, underscoring the fragility of human bonds in the face of technological and existential challenges, and ultimately leaving a feeling of dread that isn't necessarily about being scared, but about being forgotten. I think that 2000s Japan was characterized immensely by this urban legend or myth feel to it, and it's something that is still somewhat present in the current day. In my time visiting Japan, I got a feel walking around this technologically advanced country that part of that was still alive though, through all the old electronic store and how well everything is kept there, like remains of an era long gone. I do think there is a case to be made for why both Dempa and Hyperreality are important to what I want to portray. Mostly it's because they're close and quite similar in some regards, but couldn't really be more apart. They're sort of in a symbiotic relationship and where one of them exists, in this case Dempa, it's clearly impossible to see the absence of the other. While hyperreality deals with the blurring of boundaries between reality and simulation, Dempa culture is seen as a form of escapism or alternative reality-seeking behavior with a hyperreal context. Dempa K immerse themselves in fantastical or fictional worlds as a way to cope with or escape from the complexities and pressures of everyday life, but in doing so create a hyper-real environment for themselves. I'd say Dempa closely relates to the paranoia of the neat archetype of people, those that are neither in education, employment, nor training. Dempa culture often intersects with otaku culture in that sense which revolves around intense consumption of media such as manga, anime, and video games. Otaku culture with its emphasis on immersive fictional worlds and virtual identities can also be considered as a modem operando of a hyperreal framework. A lot of my favorite media falls in that category and even a lot of media that I've covered on the channel, mostly 
Boogie Pop Phantom, Akuno Hana, and Serial Experiment Lane, but also works I haven't gotten to covering yet, but have a deep appreciation and love for, like Welcome to the NHK and Paranoia Agent. Even some I have mixed feelings about, like Wonder Egg Priority. But this doesn't stop at anime either. I think Suda51, the game developer, clearly manages to portray his feelings and show outwards that he has a love for the interconnectedness of things. But I think most importantly for me, inside the video game, the silver cages, which I'll talk about later. I think the reason a lot of Dempa sensibilities work in the context of video games is because of the way it's usually portrayed. If something is supernatural in the context of a Dempa world, it usually travels in a reserved manner, be it a small internet forum or by word of mouth. Something that seems absurd today, but it's something so recent that it could be uh, classified as current. Video game myths about ghosts inhibiting worlds have been common ever since the inception of the media form. I think some of the most known cases are the unknown ghosts of video games Halo 2 and 3. In those cases, unknown players would appear in Halo lobbies, which were mostly caused by strange bugs in the game's code. I want, however, to talk about a specific case. I think one of the most interesting cases of ghosts inhibiting online spaces is a recently found out and replicated bug from all the way back in Minecraft Alpha. There's a YouTuber by the name of Tronisos which made a video about the Minecraft bug which essentially made some worlds glitch out and merge. The idea behind this is many many years ago someone had this bug happen to them and they were all freaked out because it appeared as though someone had been living in their Minecraft world. I've been following this bug and the idea of it for the last 4 years. I left a comment to confirm the fact I was there but I've known about it for what feels like 8 to 9 years at this point. And I had wanted to tackle it in some video at one point because its mystery and mythos is what was intriguing for me. The fact that lighting remained unloaded and cannot be replicated no matter what. As if some type of entity had built these monuments on terrain that never existed before that moment. Tronis was making the video very close to the point I was getting done with this gave me a definite reason to talk about it. Mostly because I somehow wished it remained a mystery that kept happening to people. Even back when I had made the original comment I speculated if it isn't something related to a pirated version of Minecraft or one of the well-known monoliths of Alpha. I still remember seeing a video explaining this exact phenomenon some years before Tronisos attempt, but my memory of the incident is foggy. I remember they had managed to replicate it and that's where I got the idea for the comment I wrote. Of course, this is just a very strange data bug, but nonetheless it's very creepy because it's the equivalent of someone living in the walls of your house. I felt the need to tackle this, mostly because of the way it relates to the idea of ghosts being stuck in digital machines and the way it relates to Pulse. Both Pulse and this video game myths highlight the anxiety surrounding technology and isolation, emphasizing the thin line between connection and alienation that so often define this genre. Yet I think it also breaches the idea of being lonely in a lived-in previously environment, which feels very post-apocalyptic in some regards, and is present in both works. The Dempa movement's focus on surreal and unsettling themes fits well with the idea of ghostly presences in virtual worlds, and such ideas are often explored in media by accident, like in these cases I've stated and much more. I'd say the whole mystery, the internet forum used in deciphering this specific case is what gives it the classic Dempa feel, the urban myth allure. There's always been shows like Lane which permeate and excel this feeling of loneliness in online spaces. But Lane is purely one representation of the feeling presented, even in this case, of ghostly presences and myths from the online space. The disjointed, eerie feeling of them works parallels the unsettling experience of encountering unexplained phenomenon in a familiar environment. However, visually Dempa has more to do with the idea of the mundane, of real life combined with short bursts of surreal bizarre, often avant-gardist scenarios that are usually very hard to place within a certain subcategory or genre of creation. That's why I personally believe that there are multiple strains of Dempa out there. 
And as much as I am intentionally choosing to avoid talking about the more Moe Tempa centric part of the discussion, as this does not accurately portray my experience in Japan. Say my experience during the travel was somewhat mystic, spiritual, off world, sort of instantly cryptid feeling of my existence felt tiny and insignificant, like the whole population of my country could fit within a city. I really started to question scale. I think flying on a plane was more of an out-of-body experience in Japan itself. Even then, the place itself was filled with a feeling of interconnectedness and the sort of vibe that technology had been stretched and extended to its limits, with Wi-Fi everywhere on the street and so many sounds, especially in stores. Extremely commercialized, just like the hyper real realization I was talking about earlier. I think reflecting back on media that initiated me into Dempa is quite important, so that's why I get to say today that watching serial experiments lane all the way back when I did. I didn't get the idea that the world could be so entrapped by technology that it becomes utterly lost in itself. However, times have changed since then and technology and mostly the internet has spread like wildfire in a way that encapsulates us and often breaks our only leeway into flying, crushing our wings. It's the sort of way our planet has slowly turned homogenized due to the way the media circulates in the 21st century. Whereas before ideas weren't as widespread as now, they are merely propagated even further by memes and media outside your own country of origin, so cultures tend to combine. Metatesphobia is an intense fear of change, something we all feel even when looking back at our own pasts and how far we've come. Some are hopeful, others resentful, but most importantly it feels every time like you lost a small part that made you unique, and that's what changed. Coming back to Serial Experiments Lane, there's a minor spoiler from episode 8, where after meeting an entity known as the God of the Wired, Lane rewrites the memory of the collective and ends up changed. Now her perspective has shifted, she sees her former childish self engaging in laughter and banter with Arisu and her friends, almost as if it were an independent entity, much like how she views her evil persona. This is literally an in-your-face way of showing the audience the changes the Wired, which is the show's version of the internet, has done to Lane herself. She had a paradigm shift and now outwardly expresses disgust towards herself and is in a manner controlled by the Wired. I think the question is, did the Wired show Lane a version of herself which she idealized and as such made her disgusted in herself, or was it something else? The entrapment of Lane similar to the story of Narcissus. She assumed a role and she became someone she wasn't in reality. I think that's important because Lane began living the life of Narcissus and became enveloped in the world of the internet, hateful of her own striking image in this case, in opposition. This is very similar to real-life behavior of internet dwellers who ultimately become trapped in such a complex loop of emotions they lose themselves and start hating the world. It's very much like the old tale of Don Quixote who reads so much he thinks he's this hero while resentful of the truth that was himself. What really is the warning of Narcissus? Is it loving yourself too much or is it falling in love with the mirror? The globalization of the internet isn't inherently a bad thing, but this was a sign of an ever-changing future because as the internet spread globally, there were concerns about the homogenization of cultures, which eventually became sort of true. Dominance of certain languages, cultures and perspectives online led to the erosion of local cultures and languages, and in a way, outwardly through the whole idea of individualism and shoved it more down our throats. There is no good without bad and no bad without good. And the internet has led to massive campaigns to spread misinformation and political extremism. The rapid spread of information and the way people psychologically work has led to these types of systems getting abused, which often end up leading to social polarization, political instability and even violence in some cases. But my he point here isn't to police it that way, because I sort of love the internet for what it is, even if it isn't as tight-knit as it used to be. Without exposure to it, I wouldn't have gotten my exposure to all these kinds of cultures and couldn't filter the ideas by myself. 
But that's the thing. Throughout my whole time in Japan, I had felt that I'd seen all of that already. Not only that, but the feeling of homogenization couldn't have been stronger, especially around tourists, heavy locations. Hearing American tourists in Akihabara felt quite surreal. This is the pain tourism causes at the end of the day. It boosts economies, furthers development of countries, but the way the cultures mix and everything gets Americanized is quite sincerely scary. It infects everything because it's the most comfortable, the most everything everywhere all the time. But still, I could not blame my experience just on that as a factor. It's definitely defining, but it feels like pinpointing a feeling to a certain cultural expanse is what is entirely wrong. There was an oxymoronic nature to my time spent there, but it was neither joyful nor sad, and for a time I asked myself why. I think it took a while for me to sit in my hotel room before sleep and contemplate that, because eventually I did find an answer. Everyone's connected, at least in some way. Everyone around us had their head in their phones, working on electronic devices and weird sounds could be heard around the city at times. I didn't know the word back then, but that whole feeling was like technology spoke to me. That was Tempa. Well, it couldn't have been in the physical sense, since Tempa is a fiction genre, but I understood sort of the idea of technology being so intertwined with modern life that it feels ever present. I got fascinated by it, obsessed you might say, because I was entrapped by its clutches even before through the works I've consumed and the hyper real material material I've seen and heard. Lane is also clearly a Dempa show, through its long philosophical entanglements and all its weird technological allegories, it's very purely Dempa, but not in the way some light novels from this category are written, more in the silver case, boogie pop kind of way, as I said before. Speaking of boogie pop, in my video about it I spoke about this idea that Boogie Pop is the pseudo half-brother of Lane, and they both feel very similar, both in vibe, aesthetics and sound, even sharing some of the stuff. That's because they're both Dempa, both falling into the same genre. However, Boogie Pop's influence are outwards as ever. The aesthetic choices in the show, particularly the oppressive darkness, grainy picture quality and sepia-tinted color palette, further contribute to the Dempa atmosphere. The use of shadows and darkness creates a sense of mystery and foreboding, while the grainy textures give the show an almost found footage quality, adding to the feeling of unease. This visual style mirrors the mental states of the characters who are themselves lost in a haze of delusion and paranoia. The result is a series that feels disconnected from conventional reality of anime, instead immersing the viewer in a world that is simultaneously familiar and alien, much like experiencing the living of a Dempa narrative. And I'd say it's not only limited to the characters, but uh, during the ending of Boogie Pop, this filter gets removed as though the characters finally got out of the haze and the mystery is finally solved. Its visual motifs permeate the entire structure of the show. The fragmented narrative where events are shown out of order and from multiple perspective mirrors the disjointed non-linear thought process often associated with Dempa. This storytelling technique forces the viewer to piece together the plot like a puzzle, reflecting the fractured realities of the characters themselves. The result is a viewing experience that is both challenging and rewarding as the audience must engage with the material on a deeper level to understand the full scope of the story. Tempa this, tempa that, tempa up, tempa down. Now why is any of that mambo jumbo essential to the way I felt upon landing from my flight? Perhaps you even forgot that's where the video even started or from my need to present my experience in Japan, anything of the sort. Well, I think all these things I've spoken about, hyperreality, tempo and everything else is important because my feelings are abstract. It's probably a justification for the fact I'm still searching for my true self, the one searching even further to create and learn and develop further as a person, yet we're still not the same yet. It's like a past me somehow looking through a window at me and asking himself how I've ended up here. I've become aware of that, not because of this trip or the media I've consumed or any of this Tempa hyper real stuff. Things are changing around us and we just cannot help getting lost in the little things. 
I just want to keep doing that, escaping from my life to the little things, the abstract and the unknown. Yet now that I went down this path, I just want to keep pushing further. I think ultimately it's the moment I've arrived at the hotel that my attention shifted towards the big train line above a small underground mall that I just felt that thing. I have no idea how to describe it, man. But the feeling of interconnectedness had pulled through the realm of fiction and became reality. The first things I captured footage of were the buildings and power lines, as well as the vending machines and the lit up signs. I felt a very strange attraction to those and even tried capturing better shots of the environment that achieved the same effect I wanted. While I was on the bus going to Tokyo's own version of the Statue of Liberty, I put on I Asia by Ferraro again and felt engrossed by the technological landscape around me. The moving scenery from the bus reminded me of that intro from the silver case. That's why, upon getting on the bus, I finally felt connected to that intro. What you're seeing right now is footage I decided to gather from a pro potential vlog about my Japan trip, edited into the exact same format as the silver case intro. And yes, this took absurdly long. The reason I was connected so deeply to the silver case might appear simpler than you or I originally thought as it's more of a purely aesthetic feeling resulted from the fact the game mixes live action footage into its more animated parts. But I think the game's theming around the maniac killer that uses computers in the year 2000 and sort of scratches my itch for that psychological technological nightmare that I've been so fond of so far. With a lot of elements from Dempa being present as well as like the general insanity of a lot of the dialogue and the more gruesome aspects of the game which portray ultra-violent murders. But again, a lot of what drove me to the game is the general vibe, the more relaxed sections of the placebo case, where you play as a reporter called Tokyo Morishima. How the game chooses to present landscapes with office buildings, apartments and shops in the liminal, almost empty way through 3D environments while mixing that with interactive backgrounds to the art of the characters that are speaking and sometimes even live action footage. It's clearly a game that's trying to be more than that and say something, but that something can be unclear at times. Ultimately, I'm not here to talk about its message, it's more about the fact the combination of UI elements, live action footage and music clicked so well with me once I arrived in Japan and I just couldn't put my finger on why. I think ultimately it's a mix of cinematic appeal to Suda's 51 unmistakable style, how its aesthetic sensibilities resonate deeply with me and the feeling of false nostalgia felt from the live action footage inside the game's opening. Perhaps the game feels so immersive that I can just lose myself talking about the way it looks and sounds in such an abstract way without really making a point. And I feel like the way the game is structured lends itself to that because in some ways it doesn't either, it does at the same time. I feel like it perfectly captures that blend of hyper-reality and damp I was talking about earlier where the game feels like a thrill ride but you can still immerse yourself in its utterly tempa-like aesthetic just because it's built in such a way to make the menus immersive. The result is a thrilling journey that simultaneously challenges and captivates, inviting me to lose myself in its intricate and emerge with a deep appreciation for its artistry of interactive storytelling while also making me reflect upon my journey in life. I think that's not a thing a lot of games do. It left an impact, a large one. It also did that while following this utterly nihilistic portrayal of the 24th district city and I think me familiarizing myself with a lot of Japanese architecture led me to a feeling of familiarity within the video game environment. I'd compare it to having a game set in your own country, one of your cities. There are characteristics you know only some cities have that appear in this amalgamation in the silver case. With just ends up turning the game's architecture and streets into the perfect candidates to project false nostalgia upon. This as well sort of reflects the globalized nature of our world. Sometimes I wonder if I'm slowly losing my grip because this thought seems so insane. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but I can feel it, I can feel a change, a tangible change in the environment. Something that will start from there and spread 
we'll all get more and more engrossed in these digital worlds and it's not like this idea has not been presented before through movies like The Matrix. But I don't think we'll ever reach that extreme. I hope we don't, because individuality and our ability to differentiate ourselves is a uniquely human characteristic, same as hope. It sort of turns into a feeding ground for absolution in that regard, and then you lose yourself to speech. In the anime series Neon Genesis Evangelion, the final episode holds a ton of weight to what I'm about to talk about, so if you haven't watched it and don't want to go through a major spoiler, skip to the time code on screen. In episode 26 of Neon Genesis Evangelion, the series delves into the concept of human instrumentality, which involves the merging of all human souls into one entity, thereby erasing individual entities. This creates a very cool parallel to The Matrix inside the movie The Matrix, and while both differ in the way they operate, they certainly do one thing exactly the same, remove one layer of individuality from humans. Both Evangelion and The Matrix confront the audience with the notion of a reality distorted by external forces, where individuals grapple with questions of selfhood and agency. In Evangelion, this struggle culminates in episode 26, where characters confront their deepest fears and insecurities as they are forced to confront the prospect of losing their individuality, being placed inside a giant machine. While the Matrix portrays a world where humans are unknowingly trapped in a simulated reality, their identity is manipulated and controlled by artificial intelligence. The most important part is the fact people are forced to gather into one unwillingly, losing what truly represents each person, their flaws, their ambitions, their past. Both do it for completely different reasons, but what makes it ugly isn't really the fact one is an exploitation of the human soul and the other is the destruction of the self, it's the fact they're all intertwined in both scenarios. Why both are problematic is that they miss on the dual tip nature of man, that of him as a family member that of him as a friend, as the people he knows, but also the member of society, the self and the whole. I think the most important aspect and the one prevalent in Dempa is at the end of the day the loss of the human identity in a sea of infinite possibilities of sorts. And I think that the same exact aspect is shown through the way speech is done in the Silver Case. While originally a budgetary thing, it gives a much deeper meaning that characters don't have individualized voices and sort of share the same echoes as the ghosts, the same mechanical keyboard sounds. Consider speech in this context not as vocal communication, but as the message is displayed on screens. It's almost as if these words are being whispered directly into our minds, blurring the line between external communication and internal thought. And I think that's the part that gives a false impression of speech. Just like the hyperreal ability to immerse yourself in a book, I'm not sure the clickety clackety sounds of Silver Case probably display immaculate writing, but they place the game within a certain aesthetic. They feel like they're trying to tell you something, they're trying to connect you through this globalized heaven. They sound like keyboards of some sort, and trying to understand this and to connect with it is something the player does through immersion. I think a lot of the way people speak in general has lost individuality, and we all have started bleeding into this mass of people with collective thoughts and actions, passions. But we're still us at the end of the day. I think I saw that so clear in my Japan trip that I needed nothing to wash this veil away from me. I had to see it once through the US and then again through Japan. But still, I'd like to emphasize a lot of this globalization is due to our phones and I think people have started realizing that while not necessarily a bad thing, there's been this trend of giving unmonitored access to the internet to the younger and younger generation. TikTok. Instagram Reels, Likes, YouTube, Anime, Movies, Music, things are reaching the youth much faster today than they did decades ago. But that means we are living through the generation a lot of people like to name the iPad Baby generation. The iPad Baby's generation embodies a sense of unease and liminality, characterized by an incessant need for electronic stimulation. This digital immersion not only shapes their worldview, but also influences societal norms and communication patterns. Therefore, it's crucial to explore how these trends intersect with the themes of Tempa and works like the Silver Case. The uneasy feeling aligns with themes present in Tempa, where characters navigate through a world saturated with technological influence. The pervasive 
presence of technology blurs the boundaries between reality and virtuality, creating a sense of disorientation and alienation. By drawing parallels between contemporary societal trends and the challenges faced by characters in these narratives, we gain the deeper understanding of the human condition in an increasingly digital age. And I can't really think of any way to describe this other than the fact it's been a thing people have been noticing for a very long time and it's gotten to the point of parody, since the hyperreal condition is a mocking one at times. I'd like to propose to you, dear viewer, this a video game that is as mysterious as it is intriguing. A game I randomly stumbled upon while browsing the Ichio homepage, which led me stuck looking at its homepage for a few good minutes before clicking the download button and being properly booted into the madness. The page just screams hatred towards me in some regard, yet it still emanates wisdom and love towards an inanimate object, the centerfold of the modern world, the iPad baby generation, a game named After this insane generation. I opened the game and was greeted with a familiar menu. This was clearly a modified Doom Wad. Upon hitting play I was greeted with a sea of sounds and colors, and I instantly felt the connection this had to James Ferraro. It was literally like someone took iAsia and made it a playable thing. It also bears striking similarities to the environments of humanity in some regards, mostly by the fact it felt like a dream and the environments blended these extremely low res pictures of the real world which felt uncanny when combined with the gamey elements of it. I think humanity has some Denpa connections as well, but it's more a work of the surreal, directly connects to this sort of craziness which is formed around the game. The goal of iPad Baby is to find God. If that doesn't sound crazy to you, I don't know what else to say. You don't know it from the start. You found a labyrinth. A town. You decide to pass through. There are people. They run and scream. They have it. The plague. Just letting you know, the labyrinth shifts, you need the objects. The game starts off as a giant fetch quest, where you're looking for objects scattered around. The gameplay isn't necessarily important in a thematic sense, until you realize you're essentially someone smuggling contraband for these weird religious figures and Millennials and Zoomers that all talk like they're severely mentally ill. I'm sensitive to sun exposure. It's time for us to start a movement. You could never understand me the way my phone does. You avoid the police at night and run around, grab objects and give them to people until they give you another object you need, and the cycle repeats. The part that left me in the most amount of shock is what happens when you complete your objectives. You arrive in a room with a king where you're informed you've done a great help to the village and that the villagers and townsfolk will never forget you, that despite your efforts your work was not in vain. I think what comes after is what shocked both me and the friend I was playing this on a call with. The moment you start moving, you manage to break out of bounds. The shackles which he once held you are now released from your person, as you're free to traverse an endless void of darkness. What once was an empty interior, now revealing a massive, sprawling environment filled with endless possibilities and what essentially feels like eternity, the afterlife. 
the idea of closure in itself. Shards of the past, memories scattered in the form of boxes with memories featuring environments which have oddly familiar yet weirdly picturesque Y2K core aesthetics to them. I for one have always been fascinated with the idea of the out of bounds, places in video games where you shouldn't have been. It's insane how few pieces of media capture this feeling, the feeling of breaking the box and living, and that includes things outside video games. That's why I've always found the paintings of an artist more renowned for his work on Minecraft's own paintings to sort of relate to the subject of Christopher Zetterstrand. His work on the out-of-bounds Counter-Strike paintings reminds me of my own time playing CS Source and how I took similar screenshots. I think exploring such a space in a video game of any kind is very surreal and palpable, but it's ultimately real in some regard. I've always had respect for Christopher for being able to tackle such an interesting idea of this digital world protruding into our daily lives. Breaking through a lot of the same aspects I spoke about earlier can be found here, sort of. The presence of Dempa and sort of globalization of the idea of a video game. The fear of the unknown as well. This exact moment within this exact game felt like I finally broke the walls that were surrounding me. I've only experienced this one more time, and that was playing Davy Warden's The Beginner's Guide. Beginner's Guide is one of the most interesting games I've seen, mostly because it's less of a game and more human connection than anything. You establish a connection along the game with whoever compiled this collection of bizarre surreal landscapes, a person who hasn't even greenlit the game. One of the levels you walk through this very simple puzzle level that ends rather abruptly, leaving a lot to be desired. Just for it to reveal many Don't rooms inside the playable space. Just like soon. before, the exterior world is shocking and at its discovery most people I've seen play sort of freeze for a second, dumbfounded at the sheer scale of what was outside. But it's strange still, at this moment the narrator points out something rather pe peculiar. So that seems to be it, right? You walk down a corridor, you solve a puzzle, you get to the end, simple enough. All right, now I'm going to modify the game again so that when you press the use key on your gamepad, it'll remove all of the walls from this room. How about that? There was more to it than we had any way of knowing. I actually find it funny that this game comes after the stairs game since they essentially convey the opposite idea. So uh, in the stairs game, a dull exterior concealed a rich interior. And then in this level, a dull interior hides this fantastic outer world. Either way, I think that the point is the same, is that most of the time you don't get to know what you're missing or even that you're missing anything. That's not your role as a player. So if your role here is not to understand then what is it? Moment those shackles which held the player bound to them broke from the walls within them, I felt like I had discovered a truly amazing game. It was the moment the connection with technology became blurred and the game truly showed its true face. It's neo-modernist, brutalist, surreal and ethereal approach to something so commonly ingrained in a gamer's brain as negative action. Something to destroy the idea of the game and separate it from the outside. And I think that's what, essentially, iPad Baby did. The idea that it is made by a human being. In this case, I felt like someone had poured their heart out to me. The game was speaking to me through this middleman, through this ethereal space as we reached the final moments and met God. The whole experience remained serene. Only the sound of seagulls presents now as we were being absorbed by the fog. Yeah. 
While I think this as well as the other things on the list present characteristics of Tempa, the mold has long been broken throughout this essay, and us referring to them as Tempa is nothing more than naming them electromagnetic schizoid games. That part of it all is the part that encompasses the most amount of truth, not the fact they fit one to one to the literal definition of Tempa. Did I lose you? Are you still here? Am I trying to make a point? Guess not by a lot. Mostly made this channel to talk about whatever I want. A lot of it is cool, I think. I like giving my opinions and stuff. I'm entitled to that, I guess, and I think my trip to Japan was insanely cool. But I also think it's a cautionary tale of societal isolation, of very powerful and present fear of change, and of overstimulation and overanalysis in our current society. The moment I stepped into a Don Quixote I felt absolutely nauseated by the number of products and sounds and feelings. I even managed to snatch a video despite them technically not allowing this. Mostly I did it by accident, I didn't see the sign at first. By the time I realized I saw them I had turned off my recording. The clip of me walking around there and just realizing how much visual and auditory pollution is in a single store felt insane to me. I think that was the moment I understood how it felt for the waves to speak to you, just for a second. A lot of my trip was spent in awe at different things, but I appreciated the culture all the way and this is in no way meant to be taken as disrespectful. Quite think I liked a lot of the modalities in which technology was implemented into the day-to-day -day life. I love the vending machine. really been in a place where a video came to place before. So you know, arriving in Japan and realizing I had been in a lot of places within video games felt very strange to say the least. I think Shibuya felt very surreal, especially after recently beating Persona 5 Royal. Tokyo Tower also felt weirdly familiar, as well as my trips to Dotonbori and Sotenbori, where I had also been in Yakuza 0. The most interesting part was by far trekking and going to temples. The atmosphere felt amazing and I couldn't help but admire the scenery and beauty of their usually red, wood and gold exteriors. It shimmered in the light rays which came out from the clouded atmosphere at times. Yet the vibe was immaculate and I think I finally understood myself in these tranquil moments. Broke the silence so common on the busy streets. And I think my trip made sense, seeing these towering structures, the more rural environments and trekking through the bamboo forest felt like I found peace with the idea of just experiencing the moment and letting the feelings of globalization flee away from my sea of worries. It was still intact, my will, my view, myself. I think I like posing questions like this to myself, but I in fact don't know where words take me. Oh, sometimes it feels like I'm just spouting nonsense. I just want to go back to a time of lesser worries, lesser time spent thinking about the day after tomorrow. I was watching the city at night and was thinking that everything, culture, be it present, past and future, needs to be protected. I think that's the time I sort of clicked well with the park-like zone from Yume Nikki. I don't claim to understand a lot of Japanese sensibilities, but I think I got the idea presented even outside this bubble of tourism, outside the bubble of the stoic outwardness of the environment. Either way, got everything I needed. I was happy. For a fleeting moment, I thought about how I've been, how I've been working in tackling the many questions of life and presenting far too much information that all seems random, sporadically placed or even inane. However, one topic prevailed amongst all the nonsensical chatter, amidst the waves of confusion, to the harsh funhouse reflection I've cast on the subject. Ironically and paradoxically, the topic is you. It's always been about you and what you can do with all of this and more. At the end of the day, whatever mirror you look into, be it a puddle, a screen, a window across a vast plan, a neon advertisement, the most damning thing about it all is that it still casts you. It seems the solution then is to have an unbreakable self, though we've often heard the stories of heroes and villains searching for themselves throughout their odysseys, the part that the 
the story is always born against or tell us to strive towards is to look within oneself with all the available information. Nowadays we are blessed and cursed with the ever-present us, the ever-present me, the ever-present you. The key, methinks, then is to take each mirror's reflection and piercing the most common factors of each, to build oneself out of trial and error, out of suffering and delusion. It would seem then that the mirrors help, or do they distract? I don't very much know, all I know is that I'm present and that you are too. Talking about these topics in circles and going over them, removing and adding pieces, is that not the process I speak of? Or perhaps just a shadow lost in technology? A dampa dream of the culture's advance, the race towards perfection, the self screaming out into the void one last time just to peek into it. It may be paranoia, it may be imperfection, but we're human, we're alive, and we should cherish our time here on this earth be it plagued by technology or devoid of it. Technology fascinates us, entraps us, promotes us, brings soul to so many works devoid of it, without its existence. It propagates and wishes to be better. Balance is key and no matter how deep I've gone in explaining the idea I wanted to portray in the beginning, damn. I don't even remember, but I think I'm still here. You're still here, it's still here, stuck in the static, I call out my voice one time, one single more time. Will you answer?